Good morning. Um, I'll be reading Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Good afternoon, church. All right, so I'm here to introduce the speaker of today. His name is Dean Waterman. All right. All right. Dean Waterman's journey began on September 24th, 1969. He was born into a family of uncertainty. And by the age of two, he was in a foster home and adopted by the same family at the age of four. The doctors didn't give him great odds of living a normal life, but God gave him an awesome family who was willing to take a chance. Wonderful parents and older sisters welcomed him with open arms. Most of Pastor Waterman's pre-18 life was lived on a gravel road in northern Illinois, just outside of German Valley, a small town of 414. He attended Adventist schools, going through elementary school in Rockford, Illinois, and graduating from Wisconsin Academy in 1987. In 1991, he moved to Collegedale, Tennessee, and attended Southern Adventist University to study pastoral ministry. In 1995, Pastor Waterman met Jody Humphrey, who he later married in November of 1997. For most of those 10 years, he always felt God's call into ministry, but did not acknowledge the call until he returned from a mission trip to Venezuela in 2001 with Bob Falkenberg and the Share Him program. Pastor Waterman began contract pastoral leadership in 2002 with the Georgia Cumberland Conference and then moved to Minnesota as a full-time pastor in 2003. He accepted a call to the Potomac Conference in 2007 to pastor in Chesapeake, Virginia. In December 2010, he transferred to Community Praise Center in Alexandria, Virginia as assistant pastor with a church planting slash multi-site assignment. Since arriving at CPC, he's initiated, developed, and launched the multi-site church campus concept with the goal of campuses in Northern Virginia and the DC metro area. Additionally, he's led the HD Pro broad Broadcast Upgrade Project, which launched high def broadcast and streaming in January of this year. While serving in ministry, Pastor Waterman invested, invested significant time enhancing his leadership skills and training leaders within the church to develop theirs as well. He's led church leadership to succinctly know this and state the church's mission, vision, values, and how they can be implemented simply and strategically throughout church missions and programs. Throughout, throughout leadership development, he's kept the goal of discipleship in the forefront, as, as it is the true means of growing leaders and for leaders in turn to grow others in their relationship with Christ. Discipleship is true leadership to Pastor Waterman and exemplifies Christ's way of growing people. Pastor Waterman and his wife have been married for 15 years and have two children, Joseph and Andrea Rose. Together, the entire family shares a passion to spread God's love in a practical, culturally relevant manner to a generation searching for authenticity. All right, today's special music will be done by Denise Barclay. She's an anointed vocalist, pianist, arranger, and producer. She has been involved in music since she was 10 years old and has been an independent artist for 13 years now. Mrs. Barclay is inspired by the music of C.C. Winans, Nicole C. Mullen, Martha Munizzi, and Nathleen Moore. As an independent artist, Denise developed her own record label, Water Girl Music. Most importantly, Ms. Barclay loves the Lord and chose to share her gift from God for good and not for worldly benefit. Thank you. All right, at this time, uh, we're going to have uh, Pastor Dean come up and speak, and we will have our special music after the sermon. Right. Hey, nothing like a little change and adjustment, right? Uh, Denise fell victim to 95. And, and, the, and the thing is, she's been on the road for almost three hours. So we, my wife and I left, because Joshua, man, i got to give Joshua kudos. 
because he's been on top of it. He was talking to me this week, and he said, now, Pastor, I'm telling you, it's going to take you an hour and a half to get here. So we left with an hour and a half. It took us almost two hours. And that was because I got off 95 and worked my way around one just to get here. So my wife can attest, my stress level was creeping up. <laughs> so Denise will be on her way, and, and, and we'll put her at the end, and you won't want to miss her music because she has an incredible voice. But let's, first of all, before I start preaching, do I ha is there a handheld mic I can use? wireless so I don't have to stay behind a pulpit. I really don't like to stay put. All right, we'll do a sound, sound check. You guys hear me okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, here we are. Your presence is here for the next few minutes. May we be focused on what it is you've called us to do to be ambassadors for you. We're celebrating our young people, but this message is for all people. What you've called is all of us to represent you to the world. So may you honor that in Christ's name. Amen. If you were to, I'm going to come down here if you don't mind. I don't like, I don't like pulpits. I don't like to be separated, okay? So um, if you were to travel, scientists say, from one end of the universe to the other, you would travel 150 billion, how many? Billion light years from one end to the other. Now you say, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, let me break it down to something that might, a little mode of travel that might make it easier to understand. If you were able to hijack a ride on the space shuttle, which is officially parked, but let's say you could get one out of the museum and you could get in it, you would travel approximately 18,000 miles per hour. The space shuttle could make it around the Earth in less than 90 minutes. That's 18,000 miles an hour. Now, let's say you were to get in your, space, in your space shuttle and you were to just continue as, as fast and as far as you could. One light year is six, ready for this? Six trillion miles. It would take you in the space shuttle at 18,000 miles an hour, 38,500 years to go one light year. Our closest star is Alpha Centauri, and it is 4.25 light years from Earth. It would take you in the space shuttle 162,000 years to get there from Earth. So now you have an idea how big our universe is, because it would take you 5.2 quadrillion years to get across it in the space shuttle. Or if you're traveling down, down 95, much longer. <laughs> and in the middle of this universe, God picked a point and said, let there be light. And then he created the earth and the water, the fish and the birds, and the plants and animals and then to crown it all off on day six listen to this everything else God spoke it but for humans he got down on his knees and started forming and shaping legs toes fingertips a mouth ears eyebrows, receding hairline. No, I really think Adam was bald. I think that's biblical. And he shaped it. When God recognized that the thing that he had been working on was done, he breathed. And Adam, the first heartbeat, ba-boom, ba-boom. Can you imagine the first time you ever opened your eyes, you looked into the face of your creator? And so from right there, God had a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with Adam, later Eve. Every day it said that, that God would come down into the cool of the evening and he would walk with Adam and Eve, right? Wouldn't you like to have that relationship? It's not just praying, it's God walking next to you. Okay? So they had that one-on-one. -on -one. They knew who God was. They, they experienced his love. 
his beauty. They knew everything about him. They could ask him hard questions. You know, anything that was too hard to understand, God would break it down to them, and they understood it was perfection. And then one day, Eve said, hmm, I think I'm going to go for a walk. So she starts walking. And as she's walking, she hears her name, hey, Eve. Oh, that doesn't sound like Adam. That sounds interesting. That sounds melodious. Hey, Eve. Ooh. And she starts walking, and she gets closer. And she notices a, a, a snake in a tree, which was not uncommon at that time. And it starts talking to her and, 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 and says one thing. Did God say you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? The first thing Satan said was a lie. But she made the first mistake, and that is she listened and started dialoguing with the serpent. And in about 15 minutes... She took everything she knew about God and discarded it and bit into the fruit. Are you hearing me? She knew God was right, but she trusted the words of Satan who said, God's holding out on you. He doesn't want the best for you. He didn't care about you. He, you could have much more if you'd bite this fruit. So she bit the fruit, and that was it. God had to take Adam and Eve and tell them, you have to leave the garden. But worse was they lost the one-on-one -on -one relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's something that happened at that point. This, this relationship was broken, and this one-on-one -on -one understanding of God disappeared. After that, God started looking for representatives to be ambassadors of his character to the world. You hearing me? What word did I just use? Ambassador. Because that's what Andrew said. We, I want you to challenge our young people to be ambassadors for God. Okay? So that's the, that's the key word. If you're looking for a word today, if, you know, if, you're, if you're a young person, you want to mark down you know, one of the kids and you want something fun, how many times do I say ambassador? You mark that down. If you're looking for a bullet that you'll take away, it's, you're going to be an ambassador and a conduit of God's grace. Keep that in mind. So God's constantly looking for ambassadors, and it's, and it's not going too well. I mean, he gets one, and his brother kills him. So God has to, God, you know, things are just getting out of hand, and he finds Noah. Noah's a reluctant ambassador, but he does it anyways. God destroys the earth, starts all over again. Even Noah is flawed. So things start getting out of hand again, and God starts looking for another ambassador, and he finds Abram. And he says, Abram, I'm going to take you from where you are to where I want to put you, and I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. I'm going to make you an ambassador. Now, God knew what he was doing when he moved him from where he was, which was right around Iraq, and moved him over to where Israel is right now because it's a land bridge. All the north and south trading at the time went through that area. That's where God chose to put a nation that would be an ambassador of his grace. So we had Abraham and Sarah. We had Isaac and then Jacob the deceiver, all as ambassadors. See, God used flawed people all the way. But isn't it nice to know that God can use flawed people to show the goodness of his grace? See, I, I, I don't understand why God does what he does. All I know is that I'm thankful that he does it. Because if he didn't, I wouldn't even be a pastor. So God can use anybody at any time for anything when he wants to. So if you think, if you're a young person today, say, hey, you know what, God can't use me. Yes, he can, and he will, if you're ready and available. You say, well, you know, I'm 85 years old. I'm past my prime. No, you're not. No, you're not. He said, well, you don't know my past. Well, I don't. God does. He doesn't care. He'll use you anyways. So here's these, these people that he's called. It's not working out too well. He, he, he has to go and put his, his nation into captivity so they can grow from 72, 72 people to 2 million people. And he moves them out of Egypt through a miracle, brings them back to where he had originally asked them to be, and asks them to be ambassadors of his grace. You see, God chose a people not so they could be exclusive, but so they could be servants and show and mirror the beauty of God to the world. 
You agree? That's what Israel was supposed to do. But Solomon, look at everything I have. When Hezekiah, when, when, the, when they came, ambassadors came from other countries, Hezekiah took them around to all the things I have. Look what God's done for me. It says that when the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, she said, what a, a, a wonderful God that you serve who has given you all these things. What an opportunity to be an ambassador, but they blew it. They go into captivity, they come back out. They get so scared that they go back the other way. And they become exclusive, and, and you have to maintain certain piety and holiness and, and works. So by the time that the Israel nation came under the captivity of the Romans, they were a stifling religion that represented nothing about what God wanted the world to see about his character. So you, you ever heard the saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself? So God says, I'll tell you what. It wasn't working out too well for all the people that I've chosen to do all this. So let me do this. I'm going to send my son to do it for me. Webster's Dictionary says that an ambassador is one who has been specifically sent from one government to a nation to represent the views of the government that has sent them. God sent his son as an ambassador from the government of heaven to the planet earth so we could see how God is and what he represents. So Christ comes, he grows up. You know the story, so that's why I'm moving through it. And he starts his ministry. And we see in Christ all the characteristics of God. And even after the disciples had been with him for three years, in the closing conversation there in the upper room, he's talking about, I and the Father are one, and Philip says, I, well, you know, Philip was the slow one, if you don't remember the disciples. He was the one who, was, who would say was one fry short of a happy meal. You know, he was the slow one. He, and he said, um, can you show us the Father? Well, and, you know, Jesus loves slow people. He loves us. We don't get it all the time, do we? But I'm sure he said, you know, it, Philip, it's okay. It'll be all right. You, know, you, you remember all the times I said, I and the Father are one? Well, I meant that. Remember when I said, I don't do anything outside the Father's will? I, I, I meant that too. It, it'll be okay, Philip. It'll be all right. As he tells the rest of the disciples, you know, I and the Father, we're one. If you doubt that, and, and Jesus said numerous times throughout the Gospels, if you don't know me, look at my works because they speak of the Father. And everybody, somebody would say, well, what is Jesus? What a, who is he? He's God's son. Well, what is God like? God is like Jesus. Jesus is like God. Because God doesn't tell Jesus to do things that are contrary to who God is. He tells him to do what he would do. When Jesus met the woman at the well, that was God speaking to her. When Jesus met the woman caught in adultery and said, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more, that was God the Father speaking through God the Son. Christ was an ambassador of God the Father. Because for 4,000 years, God's character had been so totally misrepresented by the people God had called to represent it, that somebody needed to come represent it right, and Jesus was the only one able to do it. But people still disputed. They still didn't understand it. They still... We, we can't compute. This man does not... It doesn't work for us. And so Christ used, as you know, the methods of telling stories to prove points. And I think that maybe one of the most impactful trilogy of stories that Jesus used was the three stories of three things being lost. Luke 15, I'm not going to read it, you know the story. The first one was a lost sheep. Guy had 100, 99 came home, one was, one was gone. Now, what, let's, let's be frank and be real. 
In this modern day and age, if you have 99 out of 100, that's pretty good. Don't worry about the other one. Okay? If you had, if you brought home $99 because you lost your other dollar somewhere else, you'd say, ah, forget it, you know? We're just that kind of society nowadays. But that man said, you know what? I can't live with one being gone. So he went out and got his sheep. He brought it home. He had a party. He spent more on the party than he would have spent replacing his sheep. <laughs> the other story was the woman who lost one of her coins. It was her dowry, and she searched the whole house looking for it. She found it. She threw a party. But then, we, then those, were, those were precursor stories for the story that would represent, that, that Christ was seeking to represent to the people who were listening, this is God. This is why I'm here. He told the story about a son, a younger son, who decided to go to his father and say, I want everything that's due to me. Now I'm going to give you uh, uh, the, the cultural impact of what that means for those of you who might not be aware. First of all, there's three strikes against the son, three strikes against the father. And I'm going to get to that here in a minute. But strike number one against the son was he essentially said to his father, I wish you were dead. You're worth more to me dead than you are alive. That was strike number one. It says that he took the money and he went to a far off country. Well, the, the listeners around Jesus at that time would come to the conclusion that a far off country meant, must be much less than what we are because if he went to a far off country, he wasn't staying here around Israel. So that was strike number two. He went to the Gentiles. I wish you were dead and I'm going away to, with the Gentiles. So it says, you know, that he, that he partied, he lived up the life, he had lots of friends, he ran out of his money, then he lost all his friends, and he had nothing. He couldn't find anywhere else to get money, anything else to do, so he finally lowered himself to work for a farmer tending pigs. Strike number three. To this day, pigs are not allowed to touch the bottoms of their feet on the earth and the dirt in Israel. They have to ride on pallets and in crates. That is the view that the Jews have against the unclean pig. So Jesus said, he told his father, I wish you were dead. He went and hung out with the Gentiles, and then he slept with the pigs. So the th the, 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 in, in, in the mind of that listener, they're thinking, man, that, guy, that, that kid is bad, and he deserves to die and deserves everything that's coming to him. I'm, we're building something here, okay? He said, well, this, what does this have to do with the rest of your sermon? It has something to do with it. Well, it'll come around here when it's all done, okay? Strike one, strike two, strike three, and he's sitting in the pen, and he's thinking, wow, these pigs smell. <laughs> Even their food looks appetizing. I don't remember the servants ever having it this bad. At least they had a clean place. So, he, you know, he formulates a story in his mind. I'm, this is what I'm going to say to my father. And he, I mean, I think he's wrestling. How do you go home to the man you just told a year or two previous, I wish you were dead? He's not going to want me back. I certainly can't wash my clothes before I go back, and I smell like a pig. There's no way my father will let me smell like a pig on his property. I'll be lucky if I can make it through the cities and the byways and the highways of Israel to get back to my father's house without getting beat up because I smell like a pig. But he wrestles with it and he wrestles and finally he gets up and he starts on his journey. Well, this is the point. Remember, the, the, the whole point that God's been trying to do for 4,000 years is find people to represent his character to the world. And so he, brought, he sent Jesus on a mission of redemption, but also a mission of representation as an ambassador of God, the Father. So this is the point of the story, you know. Now the, 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 
The listeners are thinking, That's, that, that kid's got a lot of gall. A lot of nerve to even think that his father would take him back. And then Jesus blew him away. While he was a far off, he saw his son. What did he do? He ran. Strike one to the father. You see, Jewish men of influence don't run. They walk, dignified, nice and fancy, high fluting, walking. You hear me? No respectable Jewish man of influence is going to be caught running to anybody for anything at any time. But this man ran. He must have been lazy. Because why else would he be sitting around waiting and looking for his son? Strike number two. Don't you have something better to do, old man, than sitting on the porch with your binoculars? Lazy, and he runs. Well, they're waiting for the story because surely as soon as he sees him, he's going to go slap him upside the face and say, get away from me, you smelly, stinky kid. Get off my property. Because that's what they would have done, those who were listening. He embraced him. Pig smell and all. And then he called out, hey, 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 get the robe. Put it on him. And then he said one other thing that strike number three that just irked those listeners. He said, get the family ring and put it on his finger. And you say, well, it's a ring. No, it was more than a ring. It was a ring that had the family emblem on it that when documents needed to be addressed, they would seal them. They would take the ring, they would stamp it in wax, and they would put it on the document. It was the family emblem, and it represented the signature of the family. They said, we can't believe it. He ran, he's lazy, and he just gave his son full rights back to the family. This is God, the Father, Jesus is talking about. Are you hearing me? So he gets him the clothes, and he gives him the ring, and he puts the sandals on his feet. He installs him. I mean, there wasn't a grilling. There wasn't a, where have you been? What have you been doing? Why do you smell that way? How much money did you bring back with you? There was none of that. It was a, it was a you're reinstated. All you had to do was just come back, and you're reinstated. And, and there's strike one, strike two, strike three against the son. Strike one, strike two, strike three against the father. And this is just a bad story. It's a horrible story. They don't like the story until all of a sudden the story gets a highlight that they really like. The older brother comes marching in and says, this is stupid. How dare you? And they say, that's somebody we can relate to in this story. That is a dumb thing to do that, that the father did. What kind of story is this? We like this, we like this older brother. He's the only one in the story that has any common sense. Because he was the only one who could look at his father and say, this was dumb. You gave him back full rights. You've, you're, you're killing the calf. That was my calf. It should have been mine and my friends. And you gave it to him. It was mine. And, 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 and so they, they look at it and they say, yes, we've got a hero to this story. And it is not the father, and it is not the younger brother. It is the older brother who knows better and is the only one who has a brain in his head sitting on top of his shoulder. That's the way you treat people. You put them in their place, and you treat them the way they deserve. But here's the problem. Listen to me carefully. I'm, I'm getting ready to put a bow on it, tie it up, and we're going to listen to some beautiful music, and I'm going to make an appeal. I want you to, this is the part I really want you to listen to. The issue that we have in the church today is that we have too many people that say they know about God's grace but aren't ambassadors out in the world of God's grace. 
We say to them, if you come in here, we'll tell you about it. But we're not going to go out there. We have a lot of saved, grace-filled, joy-filled people in pews all around our Adventist churches all around the world. What we need is more grace-filled, joy-filled, Seventh-day Adventists filling the streets of the world. What if? Now just hear me out. Can I retell the story? Let me, let's just play with the story a little bit. What if one day, the younger brother, he's in the pig pen, Todd, right? He's in there and he's smelling it, it's bad, and he's thinking, and he's, you know, and he hears a voice, and it's his brother. <laughs> what are you doing in the pen? What are you doing here looking at me? Why are you in that pen? Why are you here? I came to find you, and I'm glad I did. You see, it's been the most amazing thing. Home has not been the same without you. Father, he's miserable. Every morning he gets up, he puts his robe on, and he gets the robe, your robe, out of the closet, and he presses it every day so it's ready for you. People have tried to wrestle the, the family ring and, and hide it and destroy it, but he keeps it safe on the top drawer of his dresser, and he puts it in his robe pocket every day in case you come home so he can give it to you. He has your sandals polished every week. He won't even let us take the chair away from your spot at the table. Your father, our father, loves you and misses you and wants you home. You see, an ambassador is one, young people, old people, middle people, in-between people. An ambassador is one who's been sent on a mission to show the character of the one who has sent them to those who need to see the character of the one who sent them. And what if the older brother, rather than being angry, possessive, had said, you know what, I cannot stand to see my father this way. I'm the only one who knows and has understood and has experienced this love and understands the grace that my father is willing to give my younger brother. I'm the only one who knows I've got to go find him and tell him and bring him home. So he finds him there in the pen and he, you know, this is my story so I can tell it however I want. So he finds him in the pen. He says, you know what? Don't even have to worry about changing. Here, let me tell you what. Let me hug me so I smell like you too. Let's go home. Let's go home. And he said, I'm going to warn you. He's going to run. We told him he's going to hurt his hip. He's so old that if he runs, but he's going to run anyways. So be ready for it. And when he's going to give you a bear hug and it's going to hurt. And so they go home. They start walking home. And he, and he tells them, the, you know, the younger brother said, you don't know he's, what he's going to, no, 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 no. His grace is sufficient, but you don't know what I've done. He doesn't care. Well, I can't be, I'm, I'm unlovable. That doesn't matter. He loves regardless. You don't have to look, be, act, do, appear, anything, anyway, anyhow to him. He cares. And, and as they, they start walking, they get closer, and finally he, he can see. He reckon, I recognize these hills, and they start one hill, ooh, down, up, down, and he sees something, someone running. And the father comes running, and the older brother is walking next to his younger brother, and before they get next to each other, he says, wait, father, I brought him back. And he puts their hands together and he says, Father, meet your son. Son, meet your father again. Because instead of being home and complaining, grousing, griping, and being greedy, 
The older brother said, I want to be an ambassador of my father's love and his grace and go find my younger brother and bring him home and tell him why he should come home. You see, here's what we face today. So I'm getting it down to the brass tacks, okay? Can I be real? God needs more ambassadors. He doesn't need any more gatekeepers. You hearing me? You see, for the longest time... All right, you don't know me that well, so I'm, trying to, I'm not going to do anything that you're going to think, well, I, we don't ever want him back again. <laughs> but we're being, we're being real, okay? For the longest time, many of us, and I'm going to put me in this group too, okay? I'm not saying it's you, it's against me, it's all of us. We thought that God appointed us gatekeepers of the Bible that could only be given to people who are good enough to get it. If you walk through our doors, we'll give you the truth. We're very reluctant. We might get dirty and smell like pigs if we go out there. Oh, we, yeah, okay, so we live in a community, we, we work, but we try to get as, the least amount on us as possible. I, see, I don't hear any amen, so I must be, must hurt. Amen. Can you say that again? Okay. Preach, I heard to preach. Man, God needs ambassadors. You say, oh, today's youth day, you're talking about the youth. I'm saying he's talking about you and you and you, and you, young lady, and you, and you, I love that lavender shirt, by the way. Real men can wear lavender and pink. Amen? Next week, more of it. You, you, young lady, you, God's called all of us to be ambassadors. He's called all of us to get out of the house and go find our younger brother and tell him the goodness of God's grace. It does no good to hoard it and keep it to yourself. It's given to be given away. God is too good. Man, I don't know about you. The best testimony is a life that's been changed. I dare say that not all of us in here are perfect. That some of us travel the rough road to sit in a pew today. Amen. I can tell you that I've sat, I've, I've led a rough road to even be, past, and it's, you know, it's like the, the old, uh, the, the preacher one day was preaching and he said, you know, if I knew the things about you, or if you knew what I knew about you, you wouldn't even come to church. And the lady said, pastor, if we knew what God knows about you, we wouldn't even listen to you preach. <laughs> you know, that's me. We've all experienced grace. Now God needs us to be ambassadors and conduits of grace. I think I saw Denise walk in. Denise is an awesome musician. I, you, know, she, you know, she deserves so much for spending three hours in a car. Yes, amen. Denise is going to play our appeal song. And here's the appeal that I want. Denise, amen that you made it. As the, uh, she starts to sing, and she's actually going to do the special music after the appeal song, if you don't mind. Is that okay? But this appeal song, this is, I want you, this is a head bowed moment. This is a, uh, this isn't something to take lightly. Don't do it because your neighbor did it. Don't do it because you're young or old or you think you ought to because people think of you differently. You, you do this because you say, you know what, God? You've done so much for me that I can't stay home and keep it to myself anymore. I must go into the world and tell them and find them, reach them, and bring them home. Listen to the words as Denise begins to sing. Lord, when you placed your hand upon me, I knew that I would never be the same. 
For in that moment I became your servant And since that day I only have one name My soul desire is to be used An empty vessel longing to be filled by you my soul desire is to serve you lord to do your perfect will to work each day and build your kingdom this is my soul desire before, before Denise sings the next verse, and this, this, this is your appeal. This is, remember, this is Holy Spirit. This is between you and God. You know, if you're saying, I, I mean, I heard this sermon, and God's calling ambassadors, and I know this is youth day, but I'm not, I'm a youth, and I want to respond to that. But I'm not a youth, and I want to respond. As Denise is singing the next verse, and, and you want to make a commitment. You want to say, I'm ready to get out of the comfort zone of home and be that ambassador of, and conduit of God's grace. If that is something you are sincerely willing to commit yourself to do, and be, uh, be aware that if you choose to do it, God will put you in some pretty uncomfortable situations. But if that's a, an appeal that you would like to answer to, I invite you to stand up and come here to the front as she continues to sing. Lord, I do not seek to claim the glory I only wish to be under your control we got lots of room up here we have lots of room for I know that you alone everyone can stand up here along worthy. by me if you want you can sit in the front pews and it's you who plays this longing in my soul, my soul desire is to be used, an empty vessel longing to be filled. We have room up here, so come, you can come closer in, come closer in over here. We got room. My soul desire is to serve you Lord to do your perfect will to work each day and build your kingdom ambassadors of God's grace this is he needs you he wants to send you out to find that brother that sister who is lost who's afraid to come home because they don't know what you know about God they don't know what you know about his redeeming grace and love. I'm going to keep the appeal open for just a little bit more. This is because we're going to have a prayer of blessing on each one of you that has come up. Each one of you. We do not want to miss out on anyone who says, I've, I've got to. I, I'm, I'm scared because God might put me in an uncomfortable situation. He, mean I actually act, he might actually want me to talk to somebody. He might actually ask me to go someplace I don't want to go to. He might, act, he might tell me to go to a bar to find somebody. Let me, let me share this with you. Our elder brother, Jesus, left the comforts of heaven to come find us. Would it really be that much more of a sacrifice for us to leave what we have to go find those he's called us to find? Denise, sing the chorus for us one more time. Just the appeal open for just a moment more. My soul desire is to be used An empty vessel 
longing to be filled by you my soul desire is to serve you lord to do your perfect will to work each day and build your kingdom this is my soul desire. Yes, it is. This is my soul desire. Amen. Now I want, you, I want you folks to look at something. Look at all the people standing here. And you know what? I know that those of you who are sitting, you're, I don't have any doubt that God's going to use you. I don't, but here are some folks here. Look at can you imagine what God can do in this church in the next 365 days if each one of you spends your time in prayer saying, Lord, give me that one person in one year to bring to you. That baptismal tank will be constantly filled, constantly busy as you are a conduit of God's grace. So we're going to have a special prayer blessing that God will make you completely uncomfortable that he will give you one person. How many of you would say, I'm willing to take that challenge to, for the Lord to connect me with one person in the next 12 months that will lead to a baptism? Lord, you see the hands raised, the people standing, even those in the pews. You want to do a mighty work, but you, tr you need us to accomplish it. You've called us to be a conduit of grace, an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, to testify of the amazing grace and love, the beauty of your character revealed in the biblical beliefs we hold true as Adventists. Father, my prayer right now for each person standing here is that you will touch their lives, that you will anoint them with your Holy Spirit, that you will place them in some rather strange situations that invite conversation from somebody who's hurting. That you'll remove all the prejudices that we might have for that homeless person who stinks, who smells like alcohol and cigarettes. And then rather than run, we run to instead of run away. We embrace and we inhale the smell of sin and even more so the sinner. Lord, I don't take it lightly what you have done today. This church should not take it lightly. The people who have stood up and said, I want to be that person, that older brother who leaves the comfort of home, giving up what I love, what I desire, and willing to go out into the world. So each person, you see them standing here. May their commitment be strong. When they go home today, Satan's going to say, you know, you didn't really mean that. It was good that you stood up, but you didn't really mean it. And Lord, I just, I just ask that you keep Satan away from them. And the Holy Spirit will touch them and come Monday, Wednesday, Friday of this week, next week. They'll remember this commitment when you place that person in their path. And they'll say, can I, wait a minute. Can I tell you about my father who loves and is waiting for you to come home? May you anoint them as my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Elder, what do you think? God's going to do some powerful things through this church. You may be seated. It's very exciting to see you stand up. I, I, you know what, Elder? I'm going to look. I wish I was here every week. You're going to have to call me and tell me. Man, they had, somebody got some strange stories looking for people. And God's going to do some awesome, powerful, mighty things through those who have stood and those who have made the commitment as they have. Before we have the special music, I want to say... Thank you to this brother for inviting me. I, uh, I appreciate the invite. Do you want to say a word before she does the special music? Denise, would you bless us with special music? Wonderful, merciful Savior. Precious Redeemer and friend Who would have thought that a lamb could
Lord, rescue the souls of men. Oh, rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. always hunger for our oh, hearts always hunger for Always hunger for our oh, hearts, always hunger for Lord. Oh, we're falling before your Loving Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to have been in your house. Starting this Sabbath morning, dear God, we talk about revival, a change within. Pastor Dean comes and he's, he talked about the fact that we need to leave here ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Loving Father, for the young people and for all of us, dear God, we want to be your true ambassadors. And the only way that can happen is by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So now as we move forward, help us to move forward, not by our own power, by our own wheels, dear God, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that led Jesus Christ. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So brothers and sisters, as you um, partake of that wonderful spiritual meal, I wanna go over with you in a little way the rest of today's activities. So what I would um, say that right after this, we have a wonderful meal that we can spend some more time in fellowshipping and getting to know each other more. And then um, we're gonna have the Pathfinder meet. And then at 
530, we're going to come back here and have more discussion during our AY program. So, and then after that, we have some more activities. So, brothers and sisters, we don't want to leave this place today. I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling good being in the house of the Lord. If you want to go out there and tread on deep waters, it's between you and the Lord. But I want to stay here as long as I can. And we have activities all day for that. So, God bless you and keep you. And look forward to seeing you next door.